You asked for it and now you're going to get it. Today, we're cutting some dovetails. Oh, that's good. Welcome to episode 27 of The Wood Whisperer. I'm your host, Mark Spagnolo, and on today's show, we're gonna cut some through dovetails. Now, dovetails are an extremely old joint. In fact, they date back to the times of ancient Egypt and China, where from what I understand, they've uncovered tombs that actually still had furniture pieces in it that contain dovetails. It's really amazing. Now, dovetails are extremely strong. They're really attractive, and you can see why people like to include them in their furniture. But why are they given so much emphasis? Why is it sort of the end-all be-all for most woodworkers? Now, while dovetails are a great way to attract the opposite sex, they are by no means necessary. Uh, you could certainly construct drawers and casework with a number of other joinery methods, uh, including rabbits, you could certainly use dowels, um, you know, and I've even got an example right here. This is a drawer that I built for one of my favorite pieces. This lives in our living room. And uh, I wanted to do something different. I mean, dovetails have been done a million times before. Why do I need to do it again? Uh, so what I have is a Hatoba front, maple sides, and wengi accent trim. Okay, so if you take a look, I've actually got three stainless steel uh, dowels into a rabbit that was cut into the hotoba there, right? And I actually just decided to dress it up by putting this little strip of wengi in the front. Okay, so unique, very strong, especially in a little decorative drawer like this that holds business cards and, and mints, you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, but the point is, this is every bit as strong as a dovetail joint and uh, is really attractive, too. People look at it and go, what is that? Why did you do this? And it's, you know, it, it's a little bit unusual, but you can do that. You can make people keep guessing without using dovetails. Dovetails are a little bit predictable sometimes. So, But that being said, dovetails will indeed improve your work. They are something that you should strive uh, to perfect and to get really good at making. And one more thing to think about when deciding whether or not to use dovetails in your project is uh, the recipient. Think about whether or not they even have an appreciation for a dovetail. Do they even know what a dovetail is? I mean, when I look around the forums and, and just hear the conversations that go on, sometimes it seems to me that we're making dovetails to impress other woodworkers. Uh, you know, when you look at the fine difference between a hand-cut dovetail and one that was cut by a machine, usually either a, it's gotta be a very discriminating uh, person who collects furniture or a woodworker. You know, those are the only two people who can really pick out the difference between them. Uh, and like I said, some people don't even know what a dovetail is. So you need to keep that in mind when designing a project for a customer or, you know, even a family member. You know, the other thing is you don't necessarily want to let your customers or your recipients standards of quality dictate your level of quality. So if dovetails are the way you think drawers should be constructed, then do that because that's the, way, that's the standard you set for yourself. I mean, the day I let a, a customer's standards dictate my stopping point in a project is the day that you know, I stop caring about my craft. Now, before proceeding, we should probably talk a little bit about terminology. A lot of times with dovetails, you know, you've got the, the terminology pins, tails, you're not really sure what should be your drawer front, which one should be your side. Uh, it can get pretty confusing, so let's go over that really quickly. I've got two boards here, and at first glance, they look pretty similar, right? 
Okay, but one of these is our tail board and the other is our pin board. And of course, one of these is our drawer front and the other would be the drawer side, all right? So let me first show you the way I always tell them apart. If you look really closely at them, face on like this, one of them looks like a bird's tail, you know, or a duck's tail or something. The other one doesn't, okay? This one where the uh, sides flare out like that, to me, that looks like a tail and that is your tail board. These are pins because they're not the tail board. I don't really know anything. There's nothing about that that makes me say, hey, that looks like a pin, right? But I know which one's the tail, process elimination, this is your pin board. Okay, so the way, the one thing you really have to memorize once you can figure that out is memorize which one should be your drawer front, okay? Your pins are always your drawer front. And if you have a sample joint, you could always double check yourself, right? The joint goes together like this, nice tight fit. Now, I put the, the drawer, or I put the side piece on this way. This joint comes apart in this direction, which means that would make a horrible drawer front, right? Because you're always pulling on the drawer front, and this could easily come apart. So that really makes no sense to do it that way. So your pin board will always be the front of your drawer, because I will not get this apart without breaking this piece, right? And that's the, you know, the, the natural magic of a dovetail joint is it's naturally strong in that direction and that's why it's perfect for drawers. Um, so let's quickly talk about the different types of dovetails. You've got through dovetails, which are, you know, one of the most popular ones we're gonna see. That's what I have here as an example, okay? The dovetail is visible from the front, from the side, goes all the way through both pieces of wood. Then there's a such thing called a half blind dovetail. Now, half-blind dovetails are very popular for drawers as well. Uh, they come in handy when you are doing an inset drawer because you can't see the joinery from the front. It actually gets cut into the side, leaving a little bit of solid material at the front. So you get the advantage of the dovetail, but you don't see the joinery. And the third type is called a sliding dovetail. Okay, now, a sliding dovetail is typically used in casework when you need to connect one piece vertically to another piece that's horizontal, uh, and instead of using something like a, a dado, you know, which eh, is, is okay, but certainly not as strong as a dovetail joint would be, uh, and you would not be able to pull those pieces apart. Uh, but it's a very good joinery for, uh, for casework. Now, since we're doing machine cut through dovetails today, we should probably talk about the jigs. There's a lot of jigs on the market, and I can't even pretend to have used them all. Uh, I started off with a Rockler jig years ago, the old version of the Rockler jig, and graduated to this big guy here, the, the Akita, which is a pretty pricey unit. Okay, let me turn it around for you. Major upgrade over the Rockler unit. The Rockler unit was okay, but it was very frustrating to use, and uh, I didn't find it very accurate. And uh, by the time I was done, I wanted to run it over with my car. But upgraded to the Akita, which is a, I consider it an overpriced unit, but very repeatable, very quick setup, probably one of the quickest setup dovetail jigs on the market, but you're very limited in your spacing. Um, but it is a, a pretty cool unit, and um, I've had some luck with it. Now here comes the big daddy. This is my pride and joy. This is, well, before I install it, let me show it to you. It's the Lee D4R, and in fact, this is relatively new to the Wood Whisperer shop. This is, um, you know, what I consider to be the industry standard or what, you know, what all other dovetail jigs wish they were. Um, it's a fantastic jig, the ultimate in adjustability uh, with your finger spacing. And, um, you know, you just can't say enough good things about a jig like this. Anybody who's used one uh, knows exactly what I'm talking about. I do feel that it's well worth the investment. Um, and in fact, if, if, if you don't think it's worth the investment, uh, Lee has come out with a number of other jigs in their super jig line that are a little bit different in the concept, but the quality is still there. Definitely worth checking out. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do a review on those one day. So this one, I just pop into the holes, like so, and I've got a nice sturdy work surface where I can actually cut my dovetails and move my dovetail station around the shop. It's really handy. So now it's time to set up our routers. Uh, we're actually gonna look at our, our parts here and see what we've got to work with. I've got my Wengi fronts and backs. Actually, the backs are maple. They're half-inch material, 
And then all of my side pieces here, all six of my side pieces are also half inch material. Now, that's really important. The thickness of your material, no matter what jig you're using, is going to dictate certain setup positions or even bit sizes uh, in the instruction manual here. Okay, so you're going to live and die by this manual, and no matter how many times I use my jigs, no matter what brand they are, I am glued to this manual when I'm cutting my dovetails because I don't want to make any mistakes. So with a half inch material, Lee has the recommended bit sizes, and we're going to use two bits for this. And that's the process that's involved in making through dovetails. So we're going to quickly put on the 8 millimeter collet into the router. This is a 7 16 of an inch guide bushing, and that's a very common size. In fact, I've got two of them because I've got one from another kit, and that's what I'm going to use on my second router. Very simple. You just place it in here. There's a little recessed groove. This guy drops in, okay, and the little knurled nut, if you will, screws in from the other side. Okay, and then you tighten it as good as you can. You really want to tighten that down as hard as you can with your fingers because this will vibrate a lot and you don't want that to loosen up while you're routing. Now one more thing before we actually make any cuts. A lot of times different manufacturers require you to do different little things to make sure that the the boards for your drawers are facing in a particular direction so that they're milled properly. In this particular case, I don't even remember exactly what faces out, what faces in for, for the individual cuts, but I'm, I'm going to prepare for that by marking the inside and the outside of each piece so that we can have them straightened out later. Now, if you've got particular pieces that look exceptional, you know, for instance, you want a particular orientation of your drawers one way or the other, the good thing is, the way this is going to work, it's not going to matter. You could flip that back and forth, but you will probably have a side that looks better than the other. In this case, these are almost identical, but in a lot of cases, one looks better than the other. So you want to mark the inside and the outside, so it's very clearly which side is which. And now, Lee recommends doing this. They want you to put a little box like this, and then they put an arrow indicating inside and outside. The other piece will have the arrow pointed to the outside, and that, that's kind of crazy. Those are awfully similar, and from you know, a couple feet away, they look the same to me. So I don't even bother with that. I use a very tricky, almost, I don't know, this is almost next level stuff. But if this is the inside, I'm going to put the letter I. And if this is the outside, wait, wait for it, wait for it the letter O. And one thing you're always going to have to contend with when you're cutting dovetails is the war on tear out. Okay? When you're actually rounding through boards like this, the grain, which is running vertically, can very easily just crack and bend down. So this can be a very big problem, especially on splintery nasty woods like Wenge. Uh, it's a real problem. So what I usually do to combat that, I've, I've got a few tricks and I'll show you those in a bit on the jig itself, but to sort of stack the cards in my favor, it'd be nice if I could do something at this stage to prepare this piece. One thing that you can do is use one of these traditional scribes to actually scribe a line at the exact point where that bit is going to plunge through. And what that'll do is sever the fibers in that location and then make for an, uh, pretty much the smoothest possible cut you can get. All right, so let's do that really quickly. I start by using my side piece as reference because I want to know what the exact thickness of that side piece is. And then I'm going to transfer that thickness to my front piece. Now, I'm really only concerned about the outsides because it's really where the most visible area would be where tear out can occur. And in most cases, that's going to actually be the exit side on the jig. So it's important that we scribe on those locations. Okay, so it's very simple. You just run it along the edge. Okay, and do as many, you know, take your time, do as many passes as it takes just to make sure you sever those front fibers like that. So now we need to set up the actual arrangement of the pins and tails on our board. And some jigs are more flexible than others, some don't give you any flexibility at all. Uh, for instance, the Akita is only flexible in terms of eighth inch increments. Um, what makes the Lee such a great jig? and there may be a few others out there, but I know one of the hallmarks of this jig is the fact that it's infinitely adjustable. Um, so let me show you how we're gonna do that real quick. I'm just taking one of my side pieces, which would be one of our pin boards, 
and I'm mounting it into the jig. Bring it up to the bottom of the guide here. So this is the template. These little fingers dictate what we're actually going to be doing for the operation. The angled ones here, these are going to be for when we're cutting the pins, the side pieces, and the other side, you flip it over, are for when we're doing the tails. Okay, so even though we're at, we are actually going to cut the tails first, in order to set up our design, I'm going to use this side. I'm going to use the pin side because I can actually visualize what the uh, joint is going to look like much better on the pin side than I can on the tail side. So just slide the fingers onto the jig. Oops. Helps if you slide both sides at the same speed. Okay, and I'm going to lock that guy in place. Okay, so now once we're in position, we're in a great situation here where we could look from an overhead view and see what the shape of our joint is going to look like. Okay, now these all separate and they move freely. That's the infinite adjustability here. And they tighten down with that little screw head there. So what you want to do is make sure we ignore this first one and we're going to ignore the last one. Okay, these are actually both just for extra support as the router sort of moves off the space here. Okay, since this is the pin board, I'm sure some of you have heard people say that you always want to start with a half pin on the side, meaning you want wood here and you want wood on the end here. That gives you the ultimate in strength and it also ensures symmetry. So what I like to do is I make this little finger pretty much even with the outside of the board here. Okay, a lot of times you could just eyeball it. You know, it looks like maybe about a sixteenth of an inch of wood is exposed on the side here. And then I'm going to push down on the finger and lock that guy down. Now I'm going to do the same thing on this other side. Okay, and this guy has to be... Okay, that should be it. So let's mark this with a pencil and we can see where we're at. You can always make adjustments later. Check it out. That looks a little bit better more spacing, proper spacing. So we've got half pin, little pin, big pin, big pin, little pin, half pin. Okay, that's the arrangement we're going to go for. I like that. So now that we have our spacing set, we can remove our pin board because again, we're cutting tails first. And again, this is the pin side. So I need to flip this guy over we're going to go to the tail side and insert our tail board. Well, pardon my interruption, but I need to make an error announcement. Before you go any further into the video, I just need to clarify something. I did make a mistake and it was pointed out to, uh, to me by a couple of guys on the uh, comments area of the post. And uh, the mistake that I made was I, I sort of made a rule in the beginning of the podcast that said, you know, for your drawer fronts, you always want the pins, and for your drawer sides, you always want your tails. That's absolutely true. And if you look closely from here on out, you'll see I did the exact opposite. Not intentionally, I didn't, I just probably picked up the pieces and I was so focused on filming the podcast that I just wasn't paying enough attention. But the critical thing here is I could go back, I could refilm everything and just make it look all perfect. But realistically, to me, it's more important for you to know that that is a very easy mistake to make. As big of a mistake as it is, it's very easy to make it. The podcast, this film, was actually my distraction. Um, you've got a lot of distractions, you know, maybe it's your kids running in and out of the shop. Maybe you're still thinking about some crap that happened at work during the week. You know, one thing or, one thing or another can be on your mind and you should be 100% focused on the task at hand in order not to make those mistakes. And not to mention, like I said, if you follow your manual that came with your jig, you shouldn't make this mistake. It was just a, a silly thing that I did. So I just wanted to post this correction so there's no confusion. I'm not going back and redoing the whole video. I think it's critical that you see that this is a very easy mistake to make. Uh, correcting it just means literally recutting your parts and starting over. There's no way to convert uh, a tail board into a pin board unless you happen to cut it extra long. Um, so, you know, I've got a really nice sample drawer here that happens to be a good example of how not to arrange <laughs> your, your dovetails. So as you can see, I've got the tails in the front, pins on the side, and that's the opposite of what we want. So enjoy the video. Don't let that distract you. The core points that I've made in this video are still intact. 
and that's what you need to pay attention to. Now we're gonna cut our tail boards and we have that tear out issue again that we have to be concerned with. So I'm gonna start by placing a backer board into this top clamping bar here, okay? And this is gonna be a support. It's gonna support the back of our workpiece so that as the rounder bit comes through, those fibers are completely supported. Okay, so I'm gonna clamp in my tailpiece into the jig. I'm gonna move this backer piece all the way forward. Okay, you see the little gap here? You wanna close up that gap. Okay, you wanna make sure we have full contact between the backer piece and our tailboard. Now to set the height of the bit on the router, we first have to mark the uh, thickness of our sideboard into our front piece, or in this case, this is actually our back piece. So let's refer to it as pin and tail piece. We're gonna put our pin piece up to our fingers like this. And again, here's our tail piece mounted in the jig. And I get a really sharp pencil. And on the underside, I'm gonna trace the pencil line, okay? Oh, look at that, almost there. It's almost like I've done this before. Okay, so I let it up really slow. The idea is we want to get it so that the bit is sort of cutting that line in half. Now with the bit height set, pencil line isn't really going to help us anymore at this point. I'm going to take the masking tape. I just want enough to cover where that bit is going to bottom out. So now we've got support on the front and on the back of the board, plus we have our little scribe line. So there's really not a whole lot else we can do to ensure that we're not gonna get tear out. If we still get tear out, then that tear out deserves to be there. I don't know if that will work for your customers. And before I start, I just wanna show you another little tip. I always wax the base of my router, okay? And get that uh, guide bushing nice and waxed up here. You can use whatever wax you want to, really. Um, I'm using Renaissance wax. It's one of my favorite machine top and work surface waxes. I'm also gonna wax the top of my fingers here. You know, depending on the jig, depending on the size, if you're doing a really wide, you know, blanket chest side piece, you may have more of a concern with this. Look at the spacing on these fingers, okay? The guide bushing is gonna ride in here then jump to this spot, then jump to that spot, then here, and so on. Okay, what you wanna make sure you avoid is if this spacing were just a little bit different, the space between here may actually be uh, big enough to fit that guide bushing in there, and you could really screw up uh, the joint altogether. So just be aware of that. They actually have way, you know, little things that you can insert in between here to block you from going in there. Uh, but as long as you're aware of it, usually that's enough to stop you from making that mistake. Let's uh, throw in our protection. Eyes, ears, and lungs, because we need those to work. Okay, so what we've got here, see I tore up some of that tape, but look how clean those cuts are now. Okay, now it's also important to note the technique that I was using as I made the cuts. I like to start, especially on these wider ones. These are like a single pass on the outside and these uh, half pins, but where they're a little bit wider, we use the same technique when we do the, uh, the pins with our straight bit. I like to do a climb cut, okay? I'm going in the direction that you normally don't go with a router in a bit because it's in the same direction as the motion of, of the bit itself. But in this case, it's a controlled circumstance. So I just graze the front and I go from right to left, okay? And that basically scores that front area. Uh, maybe one or two passes like that. Then I go back to the right side, plunge through, come back out, then back to the left side and plunge through to get the rest of it. So it's kind of a little systematic approach, but what it results in is a nice clean cut like that, and that's exactly what we're looking for. 
That's gorgeous. That's a number one top class prime, prime choice cuts. Okay, so now with the inside still facing out, I'm gonna flip my board over and I'm gonna put my tails on the other side. Then I'm gonna do this for all of my front and back drawer pieces and then the tails are done. I don't have to touch them again. From that point, we'll work on the, uh, the pins and that will help us finesse the fit. Now I have all of my tail pieces cut. They all came out really nice actually. So now it's time to cut the pin pieces. Okay, now we're gonna flip our template over so that we can do our pins. Okay, that's all it is, you just flip it over. These are already set exactly where we need them to be. Doesn't get a whole lot easier than that. Okay, flip it over. I'm gonna put it here on a setting on my little gauge that the manufacturer recommends you start at. And all the finesse fit, all the little, you know, detailed work that we're gonna do to make sure this is a dead on accurate fit is gonna be done using this scale up here. And we're just gonna basically pull that template in and out and make those pins wider or narrower to uh, perfect our fit. The other thing we can do at this time is we could set the, uh, the bit height, okay? We're gonna actually use the same exact technique that we used last time, except for instead of using a pin piece to mark our tails, we're using a tail piece to mark our pins, okay? So don't get, don't get too caught up in the terminology. It all makes sense as you're going through it, okay? So I hold, well, let's make sure this piece is all the way up. Now, incidentally, as I'm doing this, you'll notice I've marked this as my test piece. This is a piece of material that has been milled through the same exact process as all of my drawer pieces, and it basically represents a perfect test piece so that I can finesse the fit and get a perfect fit. I could do this 20 or 30 times, just cutting away the messed up dovetails each and every time until I get the perfect fit that goes you know, perfectly with these tails. All right, so let's take our tail piece, once again, right up against those fingers. Nice sharp pencil, gives us a good pencil line. I've got my straight bit here and the 7 uh, 7/16 inch bushing here. Um, again, I could have just used the router that I used before, but I happen to have a second router and I'd like to use it so that that one can stay set up just in case I need, I don't know, maybe I screwed something up, but it should be fine. But just in case for convenience, I'm gonna use my second router. We use the plunge mechanism to set the height. And once again, we're gonna envision splitting that line in half. Oops, that would be more than half. All right. Very close, very close. We need to take a little bit more material off. In order to do that, we're actually gonna push the system, all these fingers, we're gonna push it back just a notch uh, away from us. And that's gonna let the bit contact more material and create wider gaps in here. Okay, so we can see what we got here, that is a pretty good fit, it's nice and tight, okay? Now you can see I really am not seating it all the way down here. It will fit, I can see the distance that's exposed here is the same as the amount of material I have to go. So I, I don't really want to push it all the way. A lot of times these dovetails really fit the best the first time, right? So if you continually pop it in and out, you're gonna compress those fibers and it actually becomes a little bit looser of a fit but there's enough here to tell me that that's, that's good enough. So now that our test board, very careful, I don't wanna tear out this wingy. Now that the test board is done, this guy served its purpose, all we have to do at this point is throw in our true uh, pin boards, the drawer sides, and we should be good to go. And here's one of our finished drawers with the wangy fronts, maple sides. Okay, you get a nice shot of that. Pretty? So this drawer actually is one of three that goes into this unit. 
that I'm building for a customer. Okay, obviously, that's a whole lot of wangi right there. Check this out. Never done anything like this before. This is one of the doors, which is a sheet of maple ply with a uh, uh, steel, I don't even know what this material is called, but it's like a sheet steel that's been cut and I trimmed it out with wangi. And on the front, we've got this applied piece of uh, a wangi as well, and a big long handle is gonna be attached to that. So definitely a unique piece. Never done anything like that before. So I hope this episode gave you a decent amount of information so you know what you're in for if you wanna do some machine cut through dovetails. In the future, we will cover things like the half-blind dovetails, and we'll probably go into a little bit more troubleshooting if things don't come out as perfect as I made them seem here. Uh, it's very important to know how to troubleshoot those issues. Now we'd also like to mention that we just opened up the Wood Whisperer gear store. So this means you can finally get your t-shirts, hats, mugs, all kinds of things with the Wood Whisperer logo on it and you're supporting the show at the same time. So go check that out. The link should be on the right hand side of the website in the right hand column. Uh, and speaking of shirts, I'd like to thank Chuck for having this awesome shirt made up. Very clever. Appreciate that. And uh, until next time, we'll see you later. Let's talk about these, what are these freaking things called? <laughs> she. <laughs> to let you know that we have a, uh, it's not coming out right. Why do I not remember what they're called? Uh, there's even special girls t-shirts in different colors, because girls like colors. <laughs> That's not gonna sound good, is it? <laughs>